Howdy, the name is Cain, Tubal Cain, and welcome back to my channel. Now, in the last three videos in this series, I've been beating a dead horse concerning cutting key seats, keyways into shafts, and this will be the final installment on that. Just a little bit different deal here where I'm going to use a end mill, and this operation is very similar to the way you might do it on your vertical mill, your bridge port, and I have many videos on that as well, so go back and watch those if you have a bridge port. For those of you that have horizontal mills, here's how to do it with an end mill, and perhaps you don't have the other cutters that are necessary for these uh, uh, particular operations, but everyone has end mills, and uh, let's get started. In the last several videos, I held the work in the vise. Now, there's always interference with the jaws, and you have to have a fair amount extending out for clearance, and that's difficult, if not impossible, to do with a small shaft, which might flex. So let's do it a different way. We'll slide this out of the way and show you two other ways to hold it that might work for you. I'm going to hold the shaft directly in the T-slot, which is a very common way of doing it, and uh, clamp it down as such. Now that's a quarter inch end mill, because I'm going to cut a quarter inch key seat. I have extended it a little farther than what I would want, because there is the possibility here of running your holder into the milling machine table, especially on smaller shafts. We'll try it with V-blocks to raise it up here in a minute. But let's do it this way first. I think I may have mentioned this in another video, but this slot here, which I guess is a coolant slot, is not machined. It's rather uh, rough, put in there just by the foundry process. So to hold the work in there may not be accurate, but then again, it may be good enough. I'm not really sure. I'm not going to check it with an indicator, but that's some possibility on these smaller mills for you to, to move the work farther out so that it doesn't interfere. Interference is always a problem on uh, these milling machines. You need to hold your work with at least two clamps in a manner similar to this. Clamping on the milling machine is another whole subject in itself, so just very briefly here. I only had one of these clamps for some reason, the short ones. Also, if I would use the short one, notice that the bolt is pretty much right in the middle, and we generally like to have the bolt closer to the work than the spacer. So I'm going to take this off and use the extra long one, which consumes about the entire width of the table, and will obstruct the view a little bit. You know what? I take it back. I'm going to use this stubby one here, because then the view is not obstructed here with a clamp that's going to set like this, as far as the filming is concerned. I don't really like this short clamp, but it's going to have to do. Here's the setup. The clamps are tight. This is rather difficult to photograph, and it's just as difficult for the operator to see what he's doing. In fact, I have to stand over on this side and look in from this way, probably with a flashlight. It's a quarter-inch end mill. I'm going to run it at 1,500 RPM, and the shaft is an oddball size, simply because I had plenty of material that size. It's 15 sixteenths and a quarter-inch key. So the setover is .594. The depth of cut, once I touch off, is 0.142, and then the overall dimension there, after the key is installed, is 1.045. And that's what the keys look like. I do not have a pulley or a sprocket or any device that has a 15 16 bore, so I'm not really going to fit it up to anything, because this is just a demonstration. Tell your friends about my videos. I'm not getting very many views on this type of content. Well, I'm going to touch off now, and I've shown you several methods. Uh, one with paper, a very good one is tape. The green tape really shows up good. I just happen to have it in stock. But in this case, I've already put just a little bit of bluing on there. Actually, it's a Sharpie, and I'm going to come up until I make a shaving. So I'm actually going to put a mark into the work. Now if that's objectionable, not, do not do it that way. But a lot of times a little nick there could matter less.
Can you see a slight shaving? A slight cut? Off camera I have zeroed out the graduated dial on the knee crank. Back up a little bit so you don't break your cutter off. And remember I'm going to raise the table now, to raise the work. 594 thousandths. The center of the spindle is on the center of the shaft. I think it should be apparent in this view. Earlier I spoke of clearances, so make sure that you have the correct clearance here. Now I'm only going to be feeding in a relatively small amount, so the tool holder is not going to strike the table. But you always want to take a dry run through uh, your setup before you start making chips to see if the whole thing is going to work without damage to the tool, the machine, or the work. Now I need to touch off. And by the way, I'm going to make the uh, key seat an inch and a half long. Can you see the black mark over here? But for now, I want to turn the machine on and uh, bring it up. And I'm just going to use paper. And this paper is three thousandths thick. It's not cardstock, it's just tablet paper. So I'll hold it in there, and when I strike that, I'll feel it drag or kick out. That's it. So I'm actually three thousandths away from the work. I'm pretty much on the edge. Move the table so the cutter is clearing the work and I'm going to set the crank graduated dial on the uh, Y crossfeed to zero. I'm going to take the cut now in three or four passes. Why don't I take it to full depth? Because a smaller end mill sometimes tends to deflect and if you take a heavy cut and feed fast it probably won't be a straight line or it'll be oversized so that's why I'm taking it in several Cuts. Plus, I'm a man who wears both suspenders and a belt. I temporarily moved the cutter over to the end of the cut by the black mark. I would like to end up in the exact same spot every time for two reasons. Number one, that it looks better, but secondly, so I don't feed in too deep and break off the cutter right at the end, perhaps. Now, this machine has two stops on the table. One here and one on the other end. But really all they do, they don't really stop the table, they stop the power feed and trip the power feed off. I'm not going to use the power feed and I don't believe that it would stop in exactly the same spot each time. I think it would just be approximate. So take a look at how I'm going to do this. So instead of using a stop, I'm using the dial indicator. I've got the Noga magnetic holder mounted here on the iron gearbox for the feed. And I think I will use the feed, by the way. And then up here, the tip of the indicator up against the clamp. So you won't see this in the video, but I'll be watching it. Let me back it up. So when it comes to zero, and just a little bit over one inch on the small, or 100,000 on the small dial. I'll be at the end of the cut and I can be consistent and accurate. Possibly this is senseless. Now I realize that was a terribly long introduction and the actual cutting of the keyway takes only a fraction of that, but the setup is important, but I'm ready to go and I'm using power feed at .44 as I did in earlier videos. And there's some oil on the cutter. Wear your glasses and be careful.
this is the second pass. And I will not show all of that. And as I told you before, it's very difficult to see what's going on in this particular setup. Use plenty of oil. Now this is the third and final pass. A total of 145 thousandths. And then the job is done. Okay, that concludes this part of the video. Let me move on now to the larger shaft, and I may not go through all of that because we're running a little bit long here now, but that'll be a 1 and 1 16th diameter shaft. There may be times when you have a shaft much longer than what I've been doing here in the last few minutes, such as this, or it might even be so long that it extends past the table. Now, on this particular table, these T-slots do not run through, that is, the work would butt up against this casting right here, which is for coolant. So on a real long piece, we'd have to use V-blocks. Now you need to use a matched set of V-blocks. Not just any old V-blocks, but a pair that is exactly the same. And do not use those U-clamps that go around here. We're going to use regular hold-down clamps. Now how do you get the work perfectly parallel with the table? There's different ways of doing it. You could indicate it, but using uh, this is a 9 16 square because these are 9 16 T slots, but we can put that into the T slot like that and bring the V blocks up against. Then we're assured that they're parallel, and then put our clamps on. Now, depending on where you're uh, key seat is going to be, whether it's here or here, you know, maybe in the middle, no telling where it is, but clamp it as securely as you can and as close to the V-blocks as possible. In other, in other words, we don't want this much sticking out if we don't have to. That'll work all right on larger diameter shafts, but on a half inch shaft or something like that, it is going to flex on you and be problematic. All right, if anyone's still with me, I'm doing it all again with a 1 and 1 16th shaft. That's the clamped setup, a little bit different with the V-blocks. So it looks like this. You can see there are longer T-bolts. Now, I've already went ahead and touched off in both directions, and I'm ready to cut with the first cut of 50 thousandths. But let's go over the dimensions here really quick. Lee, and I'm not going to do the math for you. Again, 1 and 1 16th shaft, which is 1.062, quarter inch key, quarter inch cutter. The set over for that is uh, 0.656. The depth is 140. I'm taking that in three passes, already set for a 50 thousandth cut. And uh, later on, we'll get to that last dimension there. And again, I'm still at 1500 RPM, and I am going to use power feed set at 0.44 inches per minute. Now, rather than use the dial indicator, I am going to use the stop here that will turn off the power feed. How accurate that is, I don't know. Will I break an end mill? Well, let the drums roll. Let's get started. And here we go.
And this is the last pass for a total of 140,000 feet. Well, that's it. Let me clean it up a bit and we'll have a look. All right, I've uh, blown it out. It's good and clean. No chips in there. And you recall the dimensions should be 1.172. And this is really the only accurate way to measure, to, is to put the key in the key seat and measure it this way. And we're right on with the old Helios here. Should be 1.172. And, you know, you got a, quite a bit of a tolerance there. Three, four, five thousandths, but I'm within one or two or three, so it, it's right on. Let's take it out and have a look at it now. And I might add, it's a good idea to uh, measure it before you take it out, in case you need to go a little deeper. Now, if you're already too deep, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Looks real good. Remember, I was a little leery about using the automatic shutoff, but it seemed to be pretty accurate. And perhaps earlier when I used the <laughs> dial indicator, that was a waste of time or a little bit of overkill. A little bit of filing, all wisp, although that was a nice sharp end mill. That's how you do it. All right, that concludes this series of videos on cutting key seats of various ways, four different methods here on the closing horizontal mill. Hope you like them. Go back and watch them all if this is the first one that you've seen. This is Tubal Kane, your YouTube shop teacher, saying so long for now and I'll see you in my next video.